Thank you very much. So we will move on to the last down under and we will also leave the best to the last. And we have a very interesting topic, the living evidence in practice. How do we practice in a world full of evidence? How to filter through the evidence maze? So over to you, uh, Dr. Samuel Vittal. He is a rheumatologist and epidemiologist from Queen Elizabeth Hospital, South Australia. He is the president-elect of Australian Rheumatology Association. And uh, he and Dr. Danda and he were trained together in Australia. Okay, thank you very much uh, and good evening everyone. Um, it's a real honour to be here and I really want to thank all the organisers, particularly my old friend Devishish who I've known for, for two decades and um, I finally made it to India. So thank you Devishish and it's a real pleasure to be here. So I've been um, given the, the twin uh, 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 privilege of sharing a stage with all of these luminaries undeserved really, um, but also the responsibility of, of uh, trying to land this session in a way that, uh, that makes sense to you all. So, so bear with me, we're going to try and have a little bit of fun. So this is what I'm going to be talking about, living evidence. So, firstly, here are my disclosures. So, I work, uh, I do two jobs that I get paid for. I work as a public hospital uh, rheumatologist half the time, and I work as a, uh, as a researcher the rest of the time. Uh, um, that's paid for by a fellowship uh, from ANSMUSC, the Australia and New Zealand Musculoskeletal Clinical Trials Network, and also the Hospital Research Foundation. And then to the perpetual mystification of my wife, I do all these other things that I don't get paid for. Some of this work is also paid for by the Australian Government, by the Targeted Therapies Alliance. So this is where I'm from. This is a map of all of the indigenous nations of Australia. And I, I come from uh, Adelaide, which is in the south at the bottom there, um, which is part of the Ghana nation um, of uh, traditional owners of Australia. So this is Adelaide, world's most beautiful city. And you can see, there's a couple of features here. You can see that the... Uh, oh, sorry, I'm using the wrong laser. That is the brand new Royal Adelaide Hospital. But that's not the exciting thing on this slide. That's the exciting thing, right? That, as many of you will recognise, is Adelaide Oval. Yes. Adelaide Oval is the finest cricket ground on the planet. And uh, I was only there two weeks ago with my kids. So this is me going in to the semi-final of the T20 World Cup, uh, India versus India. And uh, it was a pretty special night because I had been the previous week to the, to the game that Australia had played in and there was a sort of a dismal crowd. But this game, India versus England semi-final, the, the ground was packed and we were all barracking for India. Um, partly because we love India, but mostly because we really wanted to see an India versus Pakistan final. And Pakistan had already made the final. So this was us going in, and you can see the level of support. And this was where I was sitting. This is literally the bay that I was sitting in, and it was full of Indian supporters, and the ground was wild for Indians. And it was such a special night, and I'm terribly disappointed that your team played so poorly uh, and wasn't able to win. But we had a great night and it was really special. So, uh, if you ever come to Australia, please come to Adelaide and come to a cricket game, a cricket game in Adelaide. Alright, uh, on to the actual science. So, this is the stuff that I've been working on for the last several years of my life. This is uh, the Australian Living Guideline for the Pharmacological Management of Inflammatory Arthritis. And it's free to use on the web. You guys are welcome to access it and use it. You can just go to mskguidelines.org and you'll find it right there. And I'm going to talk to you about a few of the features that we're trying to build into this living guideline. So I keep saying the word living guideline and living evidence, and I'm going to keep on saying it, so I better tell you what I mean by it, right? So what is living evidence and why do we need living evidence? Well, we know that we're being deluged by data. So we've known this for, for the last decade or so, 
that the, the rate of production of evidence is increasing exponentially. So it's long past the point where any of us can keep on top of it ourselves. So how do we, how do we deal with that? So here's another little Adelaide anecdote. This is from 1976. And uh, very famously, a clairvoyant predicted that Adelaide, which is a coastal city, was going to be destroyed by a tsunami on the 19th of January, 1976. And, and many people actually moved out of Adelaide. So this is Glenelg Beach, on the co the, one of the city beaches in Adelaide. And that gentleman there is, was the Premier of South Australia at the time, Don Dunstan. And so he came down and stood on the foreshore and said he would hold back the waves. And indeed, the tsunami didn't arrive. So he saved us all from a deadly tsunami. So how do we uh, deal with the tsunami of evidence that's washing over us clinicians? Well, the, the tool that we've tended to use is systematic review. And systematic reviews are great. They're great enough that I did a whole uh, seminar on systematic reviews today. Um, but there are some problems with systematic reviews. One of them is that we know that it takes ages for the primary data to get into the systematic review, two to six years on average. And we know that when the systematic reviews are published, that they go out of date really quickly. Half of them are out of date within five years. 7% of them are out of date by the, on the day that they're published. So it's a good tool, but it's not a perfect tool. And I really like this joke, I don't know if you can read it, but it's the doctor is saying, you should start taking probiotics now before we discover that they don't make any difference. <laughs> so we're, we're always um, at risk of being behind in our understanding of the evidence. And the reason I like that joke is partly because it's funny, and partly because we just actually published a systematic review of probiotics uh, for inflammatory arthritis, and they don't work. So, how can we improve on systematic reviews? Well, one of the ways that we're trying to do it is through this system, uh, this living evidence ecosystem. So what is a living systematic review? It's really simple. A living systematic review is simply a standard systematic review, but it's continuous, continuously updated. So whenever new evidence arises, it is incorporated into the existing systematic review so that it's always up to date. So living systematic review methods are pretty straightforward. It's actually standard systematic review methodology but at the outset, you make decisions about how frequently you're going to survey the literature, typically monthly or at most three monthly, and how you're going to incorporate the new evidence in and how long you're going to keep it in living mode for. Because not everything needs to be in a living systematic review. The, the best topics for uh, living evidence are those where we've got uncertainty about the effectiveness of interventions and where there's a lot of new evidence still being produced and when it's an important topic. And so this is the spinning wheel of living evidence. So essentially we're continuously feeding through the process of bringing in new evidence, um, appraising it, incorporating it, producing an output and then continuing it in this everlasting cycle, which means that instead of getting this boom and bust pattern where we have a systematic review that's current and relevant, but then it dips off until somebody reboots it, we have it continuously up to date, so it's never out of date. That's the hypothesis. And it's a challenge to do this, and so it's required a lot of novelty in terms of the way that we uh, perform things and, and we've, we've published on a number of innovations that we've incorporated into doing this. Some of them involve automation, including using machine learning, and some of it includes um, micro tasks, breaking down things into, into tiny tasks and actually crowdsourcing the labour to do that, which has actually been really successful. So that's living systematic reviews, but what about guidelines? So we can do living guidelines as well, and that's what we've been working on. But the first question that arises is, do we need any more guidelines? Do we need guidelines at all? So we know that guidelines are effective. There's good evidence that guidelines are effective. But we also know that they're probably not used in practice as much as we would prefer them to be. So before setting out on this task of creating Australia's first rheumatology guidelines and the world's first living rheumatology guidelines, we actually surveyed the members of the Australian Rheumatology Association to see whether or not this is something that they would want 
So this is what we found. So we had uh, quite a good response rate that was representative, uh, both in terms of gender, years of experience, and also from public and private practice. And one of the things that we did is we actually created a priority list of the questions that would be most important to users of an Australian uh, rheumatology guideline. And you don't need to read all of those, but we're just about to publish this list. There are actually 34 questions ranked in order, but this is the top 10. And then we asked the, the respondents about whether they actually use guidelines. And it turns out that most Australian rheumatologists use guidelines, but not all the time. They use them sometimes. Very few use them never. And before we created our Australian guideline, these are the guidelines that Australians like to use. EULA first, closely followed by ACR. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, at the moment, and I say this as someone who is an author of one of the APLA guidelines, APLA didn't rank very highly, and uh, that's something that we would seek to change. But this was the important one. Do people believe that they actually need an Australian guideline? And the majority actually said yes. So that gave us a lot of hope. But what we were most interested in is what are the barriers to use of a guideline? Because we didn't want to invest all of the time and effort and resources into constructing a brand new guideline if no one's actually going to use it. And so we asked people about barriers. And as you can see on the left, there's quite a number of barriers that were identified. Um, and it's actually interesting, the bottom one in purple, which was the most common one, I don't need guidelines because I, I already know what I'm doing, is one of the great fallacies in medicine. Because if it were true that everybody knew exactly what they were doing, then we wouldn't see all the variation in care that we know that actually exists in the world. So we think that they're necessary. But essentially all of these barriers boil down to probably two main categories. One of them is something that uh, I've termed techno-governance, and I'll explain what that means in a second. And the second one was the ability to apply guideline recommendations to the individual patient. So what do I mean by techno-governance? Well, these were some of the free text responses that we got that speak to this. And this is a concept that's been discussed in the literature, but essentially it's the idea that a lot of doctors don't like the introduction of an electronic or a guideline into the clinic room because it changes the dynamic from a doctor-patient dyad to having a third epistemological authority in the room. And that makes a lot of doctors and some patients uncomfortable that there's now three parties in the room and it's not quite clear who's in charge. And some doctors bristle at that. And what we say is you don't have to, it's there to help you not to tell you what to do. So that's the techno-governance barrier. And the second one is this big barrier of applying this global advice to the individual patient. And so a lot of people worry about this idea that it's kind of a recipe for how to treat patients. You don't need the doctor. It's a cookbook medicine. And what we think is that, in fact, um, a lot of guidelines probably contribute to this idea because they offer this illusion of certainty. They kind of tell you, hey, this is how you treat a patient and go away and treat all of your patients and you'll be fine. Whereas we know that in practice, there's a huge amount of nuance in trying to decide exactly how to apply a particular recommendation to the patient in front of you. And that's the clinical expertise that is essential to clinical care. So how do we overcome these barriers and build a guideline that doesn't make people feel at risk of either cookbook medicine or techno-governance? Well, about to show you how it's done. So here's my three point plan on how to build a guideline that reduces barriers to use, is useful in the clinic room, um, and is an aid to the delivery of best practice care to our patients. So I apologise at 8.15 at night for introducing some ancient Greek, but here's some ancient Greek for you. So the first is this concept of phronesis. So phronesis is a, con is a concept that arises from Aristotle and essentially it translates into practical wisdom. So phronesis is the particular skill of taking a general concept and applying it to the individual in a way that makes the most sense in the context of that individual's particular life, needs, preferences and values. 
So we all do this every day. It's what we do as clinicians. But it's really important that a guideline actually acts to support phrenesis, not to act in place of it. Because the ancient Greek term that's the opposite of phrenesis is techne. Techne is just pure technical skills. It's a kind of orthopedic approach to life. But we, rheumatologists, we're the experts in phrenesis, yeah. So the second one um, is around this concept of the, the tsunami of, uh, of evidence that's, that threatens to overwhelm us and the idea of, of, of pre-digestion. So what do I mean by that? Well, we've, we've spoken about the tsunami of evidence, but what we know from the literature is that when new evidence arises, the clinicians don't automatically trust it or incorporate it into their practice but they actually need it to be validated through, it, through their peer network. So there's quite good evidence that this is the case. So people are very distrusting of new evidence that contradicts what they already know to be the case. And so what we really want to achieve in a guideline, is we, particularly a living guideline, is we want to be bringing in all of that new evidence in a way that is, that's digestible and summarizes the evidence for the clinician, but also validates it through a network of peers. And so that's what we do by having our guideline panel um, actually interpret those data in a way um, that's presented to the clinician. So that's pre-digestion. And the third concept is this one called mind lines. So this is a, mind lines is a concept that was developed about two decades ago. And this again is based on some qualitative work around how clinicians use guidelines. And what that showed is that clinicians don't generally use guidelines as guideline developers think that they're going to use them. They, what, they, what clinicians do actually in practice is they generate this thing called a mind line. And a mind line is a form of uh, collective sense making. So they take new evidence on board but they like to filter it through their immediate peer network and bring in other sources of knowledge in addition to the evidence. So the opinions of key opinion leaders, the opinions of their peers. This is what we do when we have our, um, our clinical meetings or we speak to our colleagues in the tea room, is that we try to interpret uh, new knowledge in a way that fits our own practice and in our own individual context. And then it's a kind of <coughs> mental shortcut of how to practice in a particular context. So we, so we know that clinicians don't use the guidelines as written, but we hope that they will use them as a way to bring forth a best practice mind line. So this is what we're doing. And we're hoping that our, our guidelines enhance, uh, our guidelines enhance people's mind lines. So this is what our, um, what our living guideline looks like. And it contains a lot of information. It's all available at the point of care. So it contains the evidence. So um, you can see that we've got a uh, summary of findings table. We present the recommend recommendation itself, but you can click through and you can actually look at the evidence to decision framework that we use in the grade process to actually convert the evidence into a recommendation. Then the user can also look at the detailed rationale for how their peers interpreted that evidence and created the particular recommendation. So you can decide if you agree with the recommendation or not. And if you want more information on why it was created that way, it's all there for you. And then finally, there's some practical information that can be actually used to implement it in the clinic. So this is what it looks like. You go to mskguidelines.org. You can see all of this. It's a really dynamic tool. It's free to use. And the other thing we incorporate, and we think this will help uh, not just with mind lines, but also with the shared decision making in the clinic, is that we've incorporated these patient decision aids. So this interprets the evidence in a way that's uh, digestible for the consumer, and these are also freely available uh, on our website. So to summarise, what we're trying to create here in our living guideline environment are guidelines that take the questions that are most important to the end users, that are based on 
a best synthesis of all of the available evidence that's always up to date, that are accessible at the point of care and are usable as part of a shared decision-making environment, and then support the clinician's phronesis by uh, trying to introduce nuance that avoids the illusion of certainty, by supporting living mind lines and overall by promoting the shared understanding of medicine. So some of this work has uh, been developed in conjunction with the Australian uh, Living Evidence Consortium. Um, and what we're trying to do via ALEC, the Living Evidence Consortium, is, is create uh, best practice um, in living evidence. So that's our website there. And we're very proud that we've just produced this, which is the very first version of the Living Guidelines Handbook. This is also freely available via the Living Evidence uh, website. So you're welcome to have a look at that if you're interested in living evidence. And that document itself is a living document. Um, and so uh, it will be continuously updated. And because I was last, I decided to finish five minutes early, so you can all thank me for that. Thank you so much again for having me. Thanks. Thank you very much for a wonderful uh, talk and also giving us a new idea. This, this is the first time I'm listening to something called Living Evidence and it's all already available for us to go through. And thank you very much for the wonderful effort and uh, we have to congratulate the entire Australian team. And the session is open to discussion. Are any comments from the audience? I'm sure most of us are listening to this kind of a talk for the first time. I'm Anand Manvia from New Delhi. Uh, I've been reading papers from Canada also. They also have the living guidelines. Uh, how is it different from what they have been published? Uh, it's a really good question. Thank you for that. So we've actually been working with the Canadians. So uh, we, we collaborate directly with them. Uh, and so we were just first in producing the first uh, living recommendation in rheumatology, just ahead of them. But we've actually been working on the evidence base together. So one of the, it's a, it's a really, really important question because one of the things that we want to do is, is reduce research waste. And we know there's a lot of duplication of effort uh, throughout uh, the research uh, ecosystem. So one of, the, one of the mantras that we follow is this idea that we, we globalise the evidence and localise the recommendation. And what we mean by that is that we want everyone in the world to collaborate together to produce a singular systematic review of every important question. And then everyone who contributes to that can take that living evidence and use it in their local environment and context to create a recommendation that's most appropriate to the local context. So Australia and Canada have started this process and we're very keen to bring in other stakeholders. But So we've been working together, so we're creating the same systematic reviews together and then we're going to our individual countries guideline panels and producing our own individual recommendations. And it's really interesting because they're, they're, they're almost exactly the same and the Australian and Canadian context is very similar. Um, but they are, they are slightly contextually different. And so what we'd like is for everyone in the world to be contributing to this living evidence base and then everyone can draw from it so that once there's a, a living systematic review of a particular topic, nobody ever has to do that systematic review ever again. And, and you know, we learned through COVID, in fact, and I spoke about this earlier today, at one point during, during the pandemic, uh, for one of, one of the interventions for COVID, I can't remember which one, might have been remdesivir or one of them, there was actually, there were more systematic reviews than there were primary RCTs. So that's a, that's a terrible waste of it. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for such, oh, Dr. Hunter, for Sam, please. Rohini Handa, New Delhi. Who decides how frequently should these living guidelines be updated? Is the quantum of information or the people behind the guidelines or the subspeciality or the topic? How do you decide that? Or the time frame? That's a great question and there's <coughs> one answer yet. So we're debating this at the moment. So in fact we've only, we've just been working, I, I, I sit on the um, the Living Evidence Consortium's 
uh, methods and processes working group, and we've actually been trying to work on a definition of living evidence that sets a minimum updating frequency. Um, and the answer is, we'll probably set one. It'll probably be about every three months that you have to um, you have to at least survey the literature, but probably more often. But it depends. It depends on all those things that you mentioned. It depends on how 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 frequently the data is coming out. It depends on the urgency of the question, and it depends on uh, workflows, including how much how many resources you've got. So, but it, the key uh, insight is that it needs to be all um, uh, transparent. And so we so the, the the reader knows that okay, here's our here's this living systematic review of um, you know, opioids for rheumatoid arthritis pain. And because we know that, uh, which we, is one that we've done, and because we know that there aren't that many trials coming out for that, we have a three monthly updating cycle for that. But the, the living evidence consortium that did the COVID guidelines, uh, they were at one point during the height of the pandemic were updating um, on, on a weekly basis. So, uh, so the answer is it, it depends. And, and this is the last question to Dr. Professor Lawrence. It's a very interesting talk and I liked your final recommendation for localization of recommendations. I would like, what one of the problems we face is that Indians tend to take these guidelines from the US, Canada, they have their, it, and apply it without understanding the motivations behind those guidelines. And in India we have a situation where there is wide disparity finances and circumstances and various things. So it's very important that we not only localize, we need to adapt to the given situation, the, how much the patient can afford, mm. what is the and extensibility. So the concept of extensibility and granularity of the choices that we make should never be uh, less emphasized in India. Mm. So this is a... Yeah, and I 100% agree with you. And that's, that's one of our big motivations. and. Uh, so I, I really encourage you to think about taking it on. Thank you, Sam. It was such an exciting talk. We were really rejuvenated the crowd. Thank you very much for sitting. Before we go for dinner, uh,